From France to the world, welcome to the JDC podcast. In this show, we welcome builders, contributors, founders, well, the architects of distributed systems and decentralized finance. I'm your host, Sam, and in today's episode, I am with Jay, co-founder of Say Network, a layer one blockchain that's optimized for DeFi. Jay, what's up? Really cool to have you here. Hey, man. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, I'm excited for this conversation. So usually when I welcome a guest on that podcast, I like to ask them about their background, how they actually ended up in crypto, what led you to build your own layer one? Curious to know more about your journey. Absolutely. Yeah. So my background is that, um, I guess going back, I originally got into crypto back in 2017. Um, at that time, my roommate, he was going through Binance Launchpad. So we tinkered on a few different projects together. After that, I ended up joining Robinhood as a software engineer. Um, so I was there for almost four years. I saw the company 10X. And it was definitely interesting because one thing that Robinhood did well is they were able to get retail to start trading options, right? No one else has been able to do that in basically the history of traditional finance and also in DeFi. But Robinhood was able to crack that puzzle. So it was very interesting to see how they approached it. On the other hand, the way that Robinhood handled GME was honestly a mess, both from an external perspective that I'm sure you were following along with, and also as an insider, it was also very opaque and no one really knew what was going on. So because of that, last year, my co-founder and I, we wanted to build something like Robinhood, except build it in a transparent and trust, uh, basically trust minimized manner on chain. Specifically, that would have been a derivatives exchange that we were looking to build on chain. Um, and that's where we got started with this journey. So we then started lo started looking into every layer one, layer two, and all the other infrastructure that we could build something like a derivatives exchange on chain, right? Um, and we ultimately came to the conclusion that every layer one out there right now, it does not fully serve the needs for what a decentralized exchange actually needs. And this isn't really the fault of the layer ones themselves. This is because exchanges and especially order book based exchanges are very unique types of applications that have high throughput and latency requirements. So, I mean, for example, if you just look at um, the current layer ones out there right now, first of all, they don't have any DEX optimizations. Secondly, they all run into congestion issues, which is tolerable if you're an NFT collection, but it's catastrophically bad if you're an order book exchange. Um, and they're also a tad bit too slow, even the near ones like Aptos and Sui. Um, so because of this, we started building Say, which is an L1 that's optimized for trading, um, helping to give exchanges an unfair advantage. Okay. At a high level, could you tell us what is Say Network? Give us some more information about the design of Say and yeah. uh, why you built it, how you built it. Absolutely. Yeah. So we ended up creating an entirely new layer one because we wanted to have customizability over every single part of the stack. If you look at alternative exchanges right now, like basically every single exchange out there right now, it's implemented as a smart contract that's built on top of a general purpose layer one. And we fundamentally don't think the DEXs that are built on top of a general purpose layer one can scale. Because first of all, they inherit all the limitations of the underlying layer one, but they're not able to get that layer one to change the mechanics for how it works to lead to a better user experience um, for the exchange at the expense of everything else that's making use of the layer one, right? Like Serum can't go to Solana and be like, we want these specific changes to be made that'll benefit only Serum and be harmful to everyone else building on Solana. So because of that, we started building an L1 that is optimized for trading and we're making changes at every part of the stack to help exchanges scale and get better user experiences. So specifically around what we offer, um, there's a few different things from a technical side. Um, the first one is a native order matching engine. So this has some benefits such as front running prevention. Um, it also has better user experience for market makers and users. And this is all just built into the chain. So it's uh, basically a primitive that is very easy for exchanges deploying on top of say to make use of. Um, the second thing that we support is uh, we've changed the consensus layer. So we're built with Cosmos SDK and Tendermint. And rather than using vanilla Cosmos SDK, vanilla Tendermint, we've changed the mechanics for how Tendermint works. So we've changed the way block propagation works, the way that block processing works. And through this, uh, we've been able to get much higher throughput and faster latency. So that's been uh, phenomenal to see as well. Um, and the last thing that we've done is we've added in market-based parallelization. So this also helps improve performance. And we're currently the only Cosmos SDK-based chain to make use of any form of parallelization. So yeah, I mean, through through all these changes, we've been able to get around 22,000 orders per second that we're able to process. Um, we've also seen around 450 millisecond block times in our internal testnet. It definitely enables an experience that makes it easier for exchanges to scale, would say. This is very exciting because now we, we start to see from Paradigm, but also other firms' experimentations to change the consensus stack of your average Cosmos SDK kit, let's say, and yeah. they're exploring Narwhal and Bullshark, other, let's say, DAG or BFT solutions to basically enable a higher throughput on Cosmos chains. And mm -hmm. we could actually see, say, as the precursor of, uh, let's say, 
pimping the Cosmos SDK to enable higher uh, higher performances. So this is a really exciting change to see, and I'm really curious to see how it's going to look like in production. Now I would like to ask you why building on Cosmos? Why, why this choice? What were the elements that make you go to, towards something like Cosmos? Yeah, so I find to believe that there's like two different types of layer ones. Like there's, if you look at the distribution of layer ones, there's basically two extremes of layer ones out there. On one hand, you have general purpose chains like Ethereum and Solana. And on the other hand, you have more application specific ones like Osmosis and EYDX v4. Um, so rather than falling under any of these extremes, we realized that the design space in the middle is the most interesting one. And we call it the use case specific design case. Then because of this, we're able to get the benefits of general purpose chains, um, like being composable and having social coordination, while also getting the benefits of application specific chains. Um, for example, being customizable. And in the case of the Cosmos SDK based chains, they're also interoperable with all the other Cosmos SDK based chains. Um, so because of this, we decided to um, build, say, as a layer one, making use of the Cosmos SDK. From the application specific side, the biggest benefit is around customizability, right? So we're able to start off and like change every single part of the stack that we want to. We can make use of any generic um, parts of the Cosmos SDK that aren't super important to us, but in the parts that really do matter for the experience that we want on, say, for example, around the way that consensus works or around um, adding in a native order matching engine, we're able to add in custom uh, custom uh, elements around that. So that was the biggest reason that we made use of the Cosmos SDK to get this off the ground. And yeah, I mean, we think that the fact that there is going to be an ecosystem of applications building on top of say, and to, ends up being a very uh, strong uh, source of network effects, because as soon as you have like some exchanges that are popular on any kind of ecosystem, um, suddenly there's TVL, there's users in that ecosystem. And that makes it so that it becomes very strategic for other DeFi applications to start coming and building on top of that same ecosystem, because then that TVL can be used um, very easily to lead to more volume in that in that chain. So um, yeah, that's kind of how we've been thinking about it so far. Um, at this point, we have over 50 ecosystem apps that are part of, say, before we launch on Minnet. And we recently also announced in a $50 million ecosystem fund to help both with providing liquidity and also to help um, any teams that are building on, say, to raise money as well. Oh yeah, and um, there's also that cool thing with Cosmos space chains that you have that framework, that communi communication, that message passing system that hasn't been exploited yet, uh, <laughs> that enables some really cool, uh, cool stuff to happen. And, you know, from swapping messages to calling a contract from another chain, that yeah. definitely uh, enables some very interesting multi-chain composability kind of thing to, to, to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I definitely think in terms of interoper interoperability between different chains, um, Cosmos is at the forefront of this um, through IBC. So IBC is the inter-blockchain communication protocol. It allows, as you mentioned, arbitrary passage passing of messages between different chains. Um, so, I mean, this is being used right now by a lot of different chains just to bridge assets. And this is honestly probably the most reliable bridge out there right now. Like every single bespoke bridge that exists, it seems like there's a new one getting hacked every couple of weeks. Um, in the case of IBC, it's been battle tested for over a year now. and there haven't been any issues with it. So I would say it's definitely the most reliable way to bridge assets. Um, in the future, it's also going to be used for the interchain accounts use case, which is honestly one of the most exciting ones for me. Um, with interchain accounts, you can have two different chains that are having um, transactions that are getting executed on one another. So they're not uh, quite atomic yet, but they are asynchronously composable. So that's gonna make it easy for different chains to be communicating with each other through, let's say in the case of say, for example, someone might want to build a DEX aggregator it spans across, say, and some other chains, like let's say Osmosis, um, it'd be very easy to build something like that. And that's not really something that you see happening with other chains that are getting off the ground right now, like Aptos and Suite, for example. Yeah, we, we, with decent security, like safety warranties, building cross-chain apps involves a lot of uh, safety issues and um, you know trade-offs that, that, that make building those actual apps very complicated. I wanted exactly. to bounce back on the heavily modified TenderMeet BFT version that you've built for, say, mm -hmm. Network. I think that do, do you still have that property where each block is final and you manage to drop the, the block time from six seconds to 600 milliseconds, am I right? Exactly, yeah. So we care a lot about having instant finality. We think that that is one of the greatest benefits that Tendermint offers. Um, so we do have instant finality still. Um, and to get that instant finality, you need to go through multiple rounds of voting. So right now in our block time, like for example, with 450 milliseconds, when we were seeing those 22K block times, um, the multiple rounds of voting does unfortunately end up being the biggest bottleneck over there because you need to go through network latency for multiple rounds of um, coordination between the validators. But yeah, I mean, in terms of the changes that we've made right now, we've changed the way that blocks are propagated and the way that blocks are processed. So we've added in this thing called intelligent block propagation. Um, we realized that a bottleneck with Tendermint right now is that the super high level block proposals, you need to send the entire block over the network. 
um, even though validators already have the contents of the block. So we started sending a smaller message that only had block hashes. Um, and then validators can, can look at their own local mempool to reconstruct the block. Um, so, I mean, that's a super high level overview. There's a lot more nuance to that. I've given a talk about it at Cosmoverse, which um, uh, listeners can take a look at for more details around that. But yeah, like that, that's the first change that we made. And we saw a pretty substantial improvement in performance from there, around 40% improvement in throughput. The second change that we made is around optimistic block processing. So what we realized is that validators, once they receive a block, they don't really do anything with the block when they're going through the two rounds of voting for pre-vote and pre-commit. Mm -hmm. um, so we thought that this was an optimization that could be made because in most cases, a block that is received by a validator ends up being the block that is accepted by the network because in basically all cases, there are no Byzantine nodes and there are no nodes that are um, so basically proposing blocks that are invalid. Like in like basically every single scenario, it's valid blocks that are being proposed. Um, so because of that, we started being optimistic and we started taking the block when it's received and basically spinning up a separate process on that machine and starting to process it um, in parallel with the pre-vote and pre-commit step. So uh, from that as well, we observed around a 33% improvement in performance, um, which was definitely quite substantial. That's super interesting. In the most modern, let's say, blockchains, we start to see a lot of um, optimistic approaches when it comes to executing events. I think Aptos has something like that. And then they re-execute yeah. uh, transactions that actually have conflicts. We start to see that also on other systems. We're not here to quote yeah. all of them. But I was just so, curious. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I think that, yeah, I think there's pros and cons to the optimistic approach. Like, If the general case is that you cannot be optimistic, then I think optimistic approaches actually lead to degraded performance. and I'm of the opinion that like block STM, the way that Ap Aptos is approaching it, it's really good if you have like a bunch of different parallelized um, transactions that are coming in. But I think in actual networks, the way like what actually ends up happening is there ends up being hotspots, right? Like it's going to be contracts like Uniswap and like OpenSea that end up having the most traffic coming in. Um, so I think if you try to do something optimistic for parallelization, it's not necessarily going to lead to substantially improved performance. Because in the case of like block STM, for example, you have a lot of parallel transactions coming in and then there end up being conflicts. So then you need to rerun all those uh, conflicting transactions sequentially. So I, I think that unless you're very certain that there's going to be very low amounts of the unhappy path, um, if you're using an optimistic case, it, it it really only works if there's like 99.99% of the time you go through the happy path. Otherwise, I would argue that there is degraded performance from that. And that's a really interesting debate because also on some other systems you need to have um, you need to have the, the dependencies to you need the dependencies to be declared on the transaction in order to segregate them and see whether they can be parallelized or not. I think that's who is going for that method. C level yeah. and Solana is something that goes pretty similar. You exactly. have different designs to enable parallelization, and you know there is this whole marketing frenzy when it comes to the throughput that are advertised by systems that sometimes haven't reached mainnet. So some yeah. can advertise 50,000 non-trivial transactions per second, 150,000, 200,000, 300,000, and to infinity based on how Moore's law like bandwidth scales and everything. Yeah. You have on the say network website, I think we can find something that, um, that you measure. 22,000. 22, yeah. 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 So you tell us more about the conditions of that test and do you expect it to be the same while in production with the 50 validator set that um, that you have? I'm, I'm super curious yeah. to know more about that. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts about what we just discussed. So first of all, around the parallelization piece. Um, yeah. I mean, there's like two different approaches. One approach is the optimistic approach that Block STM is taking. The second approach is the one where you define dependencies up front that Solana is taking, that Sui is taking. And that's also what we're doing right now, I would say. Um, and I personally feel the best performance is going to come when you define dependencies up front, because then you don't have to do conflicts and then rerun them. So I'm personally of the opinion that that might lead to a slightly more difficult um, developer experience, but that will lead to improved user experience. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing you want to be prioritizing for. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, I was about to, to to talk about other bundling, but depending on what pair the trend is basically leveraging, you can you can parallelize some trades and have some run sequentially. It's also a form of parallelism that's very elegant, I think, in what... Anyway, I, I mean to interrupt you, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the second thing that you asked was just around um, how transaction throughput is advertised and like what say is actually seeing right now. Um, so yeah, I think that there has been a trend in um, crypto to show what the theoretical upper bound for the number of transactions is. And I think um, Solana, when they were saying 720k TPS, like that was based off the upper bound of what a database could support. Um, and they were saying that we're basically going to have performance that is similar to that of a database. And then afterwards, I, that, that's what they were advertising like 2020, right? And then now they're advertising 50k is the upper bound for Solana, um, whereas in reality, like 
you're seeing maybe closer to like 10K being the realistic upper bound. And that includes the messages that the validators need to pass along to vote on the network. So I think the realistic upper bound is less than 10,000 orders per, or transactions per second that Solana is actually processing. Um, and even in the case of Aptos and Sweet, like they advertise numbers that are like in the 100 to 200K TPS range. But what they're actually seeing in, in their test net right now is substantially lower than that. It's like less than 20K TPS. So I'm personally of the opinion that the numbers that you're advertising should be numbers that you're able to achieve in some kind of load testing scenario, um, whether that's in testnet or mainnet. Um, if you're just using theoretical upper bound numbers, then that's not particularly valuable for anyone that is trying to decide if they should be using your network or not. Um, so I mean, yeah, that, that's the approach that we've taken, let's say. We're not making numbers based off what the theoretical upper bound is. Like the 22,000 orders per second that we're seeing, that was the upper bound for burst traffic that we observed in load tests in our internal load tests. So, um, yeah, the number that we have right now is 22K OPS. Um, and in terms of the configurations for how we were able to achieve those, um, that was all being run in one geographic zone in AWS. So they weren't necessarily, all the machines were necessarily in the same data center, but they were still all in the same geographic zone, which will help with improving the um, network latency that is required to transmit messages between different validators. Um, and I think that that's the biggest thing. Besides that, we weren't using machines that are too beefy. Um, machines in Solana's case, for example, they need GPUs and uh, they end up being pretty expensive. Um, in our case, the machines are not too expensive. Like the biggest thing that you'd need is to have multiple cores. Um, so we're probably going to be asking for somewhere between 16 to 48 core machines being used by validators when they start running. Um, and then we were just asking for NVMe RAM. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's not going to be too... It's not going to be too expensive. Like we're observing that it's going to be less than like 20k to be running a validator for each each year. Um, which, if you're a professional validator company, that's that's not terrible. And the last thing is just around what's going to be happening at mainnet. So at mainnet launch, I, I anticipate that the performance will be slightly worse um, because even if validators did try to be somewhere in like the same rough geographic zone, like all of them being in Western Europe, for example, um, mm. there's still going to be higher network latency that comes from that if you're not in the same AWS geographic zone. So I think there will be slightly degraded performance from that, but in mainnet validators are also going to be using most likely beefier machines than they would be using in any kind of test and scenario. Um, so I think that'll potentially help um, with improving the compute uh, times for each of the for each of the nodes that are running on the network. So overall, I think the um, performance will be a little bit worse on mainnet, but it'll still be pretty comparable to that of Tesla. Now, I would like to dive a bit more on the infrastructure side. As Cosmos Hub validators here at Node Guardians, we, we are um, a bit familiar with uh, with Gaia and the Cosmos stack. And back in the days, I remember we were trying to run our Cosmos validator on a, a container that was hosted on a shared machine. And because of the IOPS limit that Google was setting, actually they were under prov provisioning us. Uh, mm -hmm. We were sometimes missing blocks because the snapshotting events would make us uh, totally, we would get throttle and we would miss mm -hmm. some blocks back in the days. And I I was wondering how we could achieve to like, not miss block and r write all the events within the the, the, the few hundred millisecond time frame that, that mm -hmm. are making a block on the same network. I don't know if that makes sense if you get the, what, what, what I'm, yeah. Yeah, so one thing that we're more okay with and say so one of the ways that we're able to get faster block times is by having lower timeouts so after there is two-third consensus on any given block um we'll move on to the next block without waiting for too long so the timeouts end up being a lot smaller would say which might result in some validators missing blocks because they haven't been able to vote during whatever that time period is um and we're okay with that we're going to have less aggressive settings in terms of the percentage of missed blocks before a validator starts to get slashed and that's the biggest kind of uh change that we needed to make and uh, we chatted with Zaki and Marco. So Zaki and Marco, so Marco's product lead for Cosmos SDK. Zaki is one of the uh, Cosmos OGs. Um, he was the director for Tendermint before as well. And um, yeah, I mean, basically they're both, uh, they both gave us feedback that an approach like this um, is going to lead to the best performance. And there's also not gonna really be any security downsides associated with this. Super interesting. Okay, okay. All right, fair enough. So some tolerance on missed blocks. Okay, okay, I see. And yeah, the requirements do not seem that, that aggressive. I think that on, on, on Vulture, on an arbitrary cloud vendor, you should be able to have 32 cores and uh, two terabytes of NVMe for, for $400 a month, probably. So yeah, I, I think that totally sits in the, maybe the lower average when it comes to the most modern distributed systems. I don't know. Yeah, um, very cool. Say is also defined as, uh, 
platform, a decentralized Nasdaq. So say it's a use case specific layer one, and you have some some choices in your design that enable you to offer these performances. But you know, Solana was also described as decentralized Nasdaq back in the first like pitch decks or decks that we were seeing. And uh, as much as I love that network, I think that it is encountering some liveness issues. I mean, we, we, we've seen it like very recently, but I think that it happened four times, five times, or maybe six times this year. So yeah, can we expect better liveness guarantees from say, we've seen some Cosmos chain failing because of Cosmosm, like Juno for a few days. I don't think that Tendermint has been the source of some issues uh, on, on, on some Cosmos app chains, but maybe that was the case. How could you ensure that this high frequency marketplace that you're building won't suffer from the same uh, issue dealing with so many events? Yeah, so I think Solana is trying to solve a really hard problem. And it, I mean, in general, the community gives it a lot of flack for the outages that happen. But I mean, Solana, like running any kind of distributed system is really hard. And especially one that's super high frequency is going to be even harder than that. So I think Solana overall is doing a pretty good job given the kind of um, difficulties that they're facing. So in our case, I think there's a couple of things that are going to differentiate us. Uh, the first one is just most of the tech stack that we're using has already been battle tested for a few years now. Like most of what we are running is going to be tied to pure Cosmos SDK and pure Tendermint, right? This has all been tested already. Like we're not recreating everything from scratch. Um, whereas in Solana's case, they have needed to basically create everything from scratch. And that leads to a greater bas blast surface for any errors that occur. Um, so even the most recent um, outage that they had, that was because of a bug at the consensus level, which I, I don't anticipate that we'll have the same kind of bug, at least at the true um, like pre-vote, pre-commit, commit level where um, actual consensus is happening. Um, the, sec the second thing about Solana is it makes strong synchrony assumptions, which in our case with Tendermint, we have partial synchrony assumptions. That's going to make it less likely for there to be um, any kind of issues tied to um, liveness when you're making these synchrony assumptions. Um, and outside of that, I mean, we're just going to be doing a lot of testing. Like, it's impossible to prevent bugs entirely. We, we understand that. So we're just going to be trying to do a lot of testing in DevNet and in our incentivized testnet, Atlantic One, um, before we push anything to mainnet. So. Um, those are going to be the three main mechanisms we have. Um, we're setting up a bunch of testing frameworks, like just making sure that there's uh, like chaos testing happening to test out scenario scenarios that our team can't even anticipate. And then also pretty vanilla things like using unit tests, integration tests, load tests to make sure that we're able to handle um, scenarios that our team is able to anticipate. Okay. Okay. Now I'd like to dive into um, the front running mechanism that, <laughs> that's uh, for say uh, yeah. and uh, the shared liquidity system first mm -hmm. uh, with the front running mechanism. So we see different approaches to enable uh, front running protection. Some are going for threshold encryption. Some mm -hmm. are going for also other exotic designs. So when it comes to say we have the freaking batch auctioning method, I was curious to know if there couldn't be a scenario where people would abuse it. So for example, if you place an order at uh, $1 and you have 5% anti-slippage protection, then a mm -hmm. front runner comes and places a huge order to move the price above $1 and five cents. Your transaction will be registered on the blockchain, but nothing will happen since the anti-slippage protection will be activated. So you'll pay a gas fee for nothing mm -hmm. and people can troll and make your transaction fail just by being included in the same block. So they, they, they can exploit this information the same way as, as without this protection. And mm -hmm. I'm just not sure how they could profit uh, with it but it's still a bit annoying on small cap assets, but I think that someone who's really annoying and smart can can just mess around with this with this and 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 and, and create some annoying situations, maybe. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, first of all, say has so in our native, sorry, order matching engine, um, we have frequent batch auctioning as the way that trades are filled. Um, so the way that frequent batch auctioning works is that at the end of a block, we will aggregate all market orders and then execute them all at the same uniform clearing price. So what this means is that if the order book has, let's say there's two transactions or two orders that are already on it, um, two limit orders. So one of them is for $10, the other one's for $11, and then two market orders come in. So what would normally normally happen if you have sequential um, filling of these transactions is the first one will get filled for $10, the second one will get filled for $11, right? Um, with frequent batch auctioning, both of them will get aggregated, and then they'll both get filled at the same price, which would be $10.50. So through this mechanism, there's price fairness that happens and um, it prevents the ordering for transactions within a block for, I mean, order book related transactions from mattering. So your question is, does this completely solve MEV essentially, right? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, and there's a few different things. So the, the example that you gave specifically, I, I don't think that that example would necessarily happen within the scope of the block, because if someone were to try to like basically both of the orders would get aggregated. Both of the market orders, like your order to buy something at a dollar and five cents and my 
order to buy something for a dollar with like the five percent slippage um they'd both get aggregated and then they would both get filled at the same price so because of that instead of being a dollar mine might be a little bit higher than that but both of our orders would still get filled and you wouldn't be able to do anything within the scope of a block um but there is multi-block mev that can happen so for example if i place an order let's say i want to buy something you see that order you're the validator for the current block and you're also going to be the validator for the next block um, so you see my incoming order, you decide to exclude my order in block A, then you place a market order to buy that same asset. And then in the next block, or I guess in that same block, you also try to, I, I guess for this specific scenario, you would need three separate blocks. So in block A, you purchase that asset, and then you don't include my transaction. In block B, you place a limit order to sell that asset. And then in block C, you include my transaction. So if the market price is a dollar, you buy it for a dollar, then you place a limit order to sell it for a dollar and four cents, let's say. And then my order was a dollar with 5% slippage protection. So then you sell it to me for a dollar and four cents. You're able to profit off of that um, at my expense. So those kinds of attacks are theoretically possible right now. Um, one way that we're approaching that is by making use, like we're looking into setting up uh, randomized block proposers. So from there, it'll be very difficult for you to know if you're going to be the block proposer, if one of your friends are going to be a block proposer in the next for the next few heights. Um, so that's one approach that we're taking to help with that. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the last thing is just that um, for anything that's not related to the order book, um, that's not actually going to be prevented through our frequent batch auctioning mechanism. So there's going to be AMMs and other types of exchanges on say, and the frequent batch auctioning only applies to order book based exchanges. So we can't prevent anything tied to that. So in the long term, one thing that we do anticipate is there will be MEV on say, both from these types of attacks, if validators are okay with doing front running attacks, which I, I feel like one thing about the Tendermint or like the Cosmos community in general is that validators, they have like the reputation online whenever they're whenever they're doing anything right so if validators like start launching front running attacks then the entire community will see that because everything is happening on chain and then the community will be pretty against that and then the validators reputation will get hurt so i'm actually of the opinion that like from a theoretical standpoint it might be possible for but from a practical standpoint a lot of validators might not want to engage in any front running attacks um but for other types of attacks like liquid or for other types of mv like liquidations and arbs um, I actually do think that those there's going to be a lot of opportunities for those on say, and I'd argue that they're actually very beneficial if they do happen. Uh, the main thing that I want to prevent is spam, right? Like if there's a very profitable liquidation, then there will be a lot of people um, submitting requests to try to get their transaction to be the first one that's filled. Um, and most of these will fail, so they'll just be wasting their money on gas fees and they'll also be uh, spamming the network. Um, so what we want to do is we want to set up some kind of MEV redis uh, redistribution framework um, similar to Flashbots on Ethereum. Um, and we anticipate that that'll help substantially with, uh, first of all, allowing liquidation and ARPs to successfully happen, while also prevent those from spamming the network. And I think long term, that's going to be the approach that ends up winning out on today. Super exciting design. Now let's jump to the shared liquidity mechanism. Mm -hmm. So yeah, at a high level, um, how does it work? I understood that the shared liquidity will basically be available to all kind of activities that you would have on the same network, whether it is spot options and derivatives. So I'm curious to know how the liquidity is basically shared among these different use cases. Yeah, um, so by default, actually, liquidity is not going to be shared between different smart contracts. Um, when you create a new smart contract, it'll be by default independent, like the order book for it will be independent from all other order books. Um, that was a very conscious design decision because most projects, like most exchanges, they're like, their moat ends up being liquidity and forcing people to share their liquidity from the start is going to result in good teams not wanting to build on say. So that, that's the first thing. By default, things will be segregated. Now, if you want to have some kind of shared liquidity mechanism, it's very easy for someone to set up an initial order book and then other people to permissionlessly build on top of that, right? So I could set up an order book and then other people can set up front ends that route trades to that order book. Um, and it'll just be uh, calling functions on a smart contract. Um, so because of that, those different teams can technically work together on that or it can be done permissionlessly, um, but it will still benefit the base smart contract or the base exchange that built those, that built that initial order book because they can charge trading fees on it. So any new orders that are routed will result in that base uh, order book getting trading fees um, accrued from that. Okay, so the, and, and there's no prescription to actually uh, share liquidity uh, or like opt in an order, um, opt in one of these liquidity pools, right? You, you can just- Exactly. Uh, That's completely optional. By default, it'll be segregated. So you have your own liquidity um, unless you purposely want to start sharing liquidity. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Very cool. 
Now, another aspect that I think is critical, crucial when, when it comes to making the choice to venture into an arbitrator, one blockchain system, layer two, whatever you call it, is developer experience. What can we expect today on, on say? What stacks does it support? What can we build? I think it has Cosmosm. There's also a, uh, an SDK for Go. Uh, could you tell us more about that? Yeah, so right now, smart contracts will be written in Cosmosm. Um, but in the long term, like what we believe in is that the choice of language or execution environment should not be what limits a developer from building on honestly any blockchain. Um, if you look at Web2, it doesn't really matter what language you want to be using. Like no one really knows or cares like what languages, for example, Google or Facebook or like Amazon are built in. And fundamentally, it doesn't matter. Like programming languages, execution environments are tools to build good products for people to be using. Um, so in the long term, say, will be pretty language and execution environment agnostic. And we're already doing this right now with one of the projects it's building on, say, called Nitro. Um, so Nitro is an optimistic rollout building on, say. Um, it has the C-level Solana VM um, as the execution environment. So people can take their audited Solana smart contracts, basically take them, deploy them directly onto Nitro. And then with no additional work, they'll just work on Nitro. And in the future, we anticipate that EVM, Solana VM, and Move VM, uh, those seem to be the three bigger um, execution environments right now. So all three of them will be supported on, say, and people will be able to deploy smart contracts very easily and use whichever language or execution environment that they feel most comfortable with. And yeah, I mean, so right now we support Cosmosm smart contracts. And in terms of the tooling, it's pretty basic tooling that uh, Cosmosm naturally has. But in the future, we're going to be creating more sophisticated tooling to be helping out with, uh, say, specific use cases, such as interacting with the text module. All right, very cool. And when it comes to like if I want to get involved with, say, the best path would just be to hop on your Discord and get in touch with the team. That would be the place to visit if I want to, I don't know, like I have a proof of concept, I have a blueprint, I want to build something. What would be the ideal place to interact with your team, guys? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I think Discord is the place where we're going to be most responsive. Um, if there's specific things that you're building, like we launched uh, a request for product recently as well. Um, so there's like a Google form where you can submit um, things over there as well. Yeah. And I mentioned the $50 million ecosystem fund before. Uh, so we are taking applications for ideas that are interesting that people might be working on. Um, so there's a Google form or a type form over there as well that people can go and submit what they're working on and the team will reach out to you with like uh, next steps around that specific conversation. Okay. And is there any room also to, to get involved as a non-developer, any ambassador program or role for community people at Say Network? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's a pretty well fleshed out ambassador program at this point. Um, details for that can also be found in the Discord, but we want to have everyone getting engaged with say um, in whatever capacity they can. Um, there's also an incentivized testnet that's running right now. Um, so we're giving away 1% of the total token supply as part of the incentivized testnet. So anyone that wants to play around with the testnet um, also get rewarded for doing so. Um, there's more information about that in our Discord and also on our website. Okay. And you mentioned testnet. When can we expect uh, the mainnet for, for some <laughs> uh, Yes, the big question. Um, so right, right now, I think that it's realistically going to be December or January. Um, and there's a few things we want to iron out beforehand. Like right now, we're about to be code complete pretty soon. After that, we want to get audited. Um, yeah. Once the audit is done, then it's pretty flexible from our side when we launch. Um, ideally, we'd want to have some kind of token sale where community participants can get access to tokens before the actual network launches so that they can pay for gas fees. So I think having all of those things happen would probably uh, take us into either December or January for the mainnet launch. I really admire also how you guys actually have built a fully fledged layer one blockchain just out of a $5 million fundraiser. So that, and very curious to know when you actually started building this, uh, was it earlier this year or last year? When were the first drafts for say coming out? Yeah, yeah. So we originally started working on the derivatives exchange at the end of last year. Um, then afterwards we realized that there's a much bigger opportunity to be building layer one. So that was around February that we started building, say. Um, that's also when we started getting the team together for this. Um, and the first version was launched in May. So this is when we had um, our basically DEX module built into the chain and the chain was fully functional and running. So that, that's when we launched the original testnet. Afterwards, we started doing some performance optimization work and that's how we've ended up at the current um, 22,000 orders per second number. So yeah, it's been... <laughs> quite a hectic year, um, but overall it's been a lot of fun. And I, I think that Cosmos SDK definitely lets you move a lot faster than if you were building everything from scratch. Like if you look at all the 2017 chains like Solana and Nier, um, they needed to do everything from scratch. And there's a lot of just stuff that needs to be redone because of that. Whereas with Cosmos SDK, you can really focus on the parts that are most critical to your application. 
Super interesting. Yeah, Nier had to make their own Doom Select BFT. Solana had to. Oh yeah, yeah, you have to create the, the whole amount of stack, and also from a security standpoint, that that that's that's kind of tricky. So well, that's exactly. that's quite an interesting choice to to go for for the Cosmos SDK. Um, one aspect I forgot to 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 cover is the um, the way you can actually come and build on say networks uh, mainnet or whatever. You have to submit a governance proposal. Uh, for your protocol to be added to the network uh, or not, which is in a very interesting design in order to ensure that you have the best performance for all the applications built on the platform. So you confirm that I will have to submit my proposal and there'll be a governance vote that will determine whether I'll be allowed to use stuff as say networks bandwidth to, to propose my application to, to users, right? Exactly, yeah. So we're trying to be a DeFi focused chain. Um, and one thing that we've noticed on general purpose chains is that when you start having too many different applications building on any kind of general purpose chain, um, that results in DeFi being hurt most drastically. Um, because if you have NFT mints happening at the same place where an order book is running, it honestly doesn't matter that much for NFTs if there's like network congestion issues or if there's downtime, um, especially once the initial NFT mint is done. Yeah. Um, but any kind of like, let's say there's network congestion, right? It ends up being catastrophically bad for an order book based exchange. Um, and the reason for that is, let's say you're a market maker and you've already placed a limit order and you want to cancel that order. Well, if there's a minute of network congestion, which is very uh, common on Solana, um, you can actually get in your transaction to cancel that order. So in that one minute, the price of that asset might go down a lot or it might go up a lot, but basically there will be volatility in the price of that asset. So then someone else, let's say Jump, who's running their own validator, who's able to get in a bunch of the blocks because they're a block closer, um, they can snipe you off. And that ends up being a really negative experience for anyone that is interacting with any kind of order book based exchange. So um, yeah, in our case, we made a very conscious decision to make say a DeFi focus chain. So any smart contract that's building on say will need to get approved by governance. I um, mean, only after that will it be able to start consuming um, say bandwidth. All right. And now let's project ourselves in an ideal future where say has become one of the go-to marketplaces to, to trade assets, derivatives, uh, whatnot. Mm -hmm. And you're actually hitting your, your cap, your bandwidth cap you have dozens of thousands of transactions being executed. How would you actually, what's the agenda to scale, say, in let's say five years? Would you spin up another chain and mm -hmm. have it run concurrently and break composability? Or, or would you have some, do you have already some idea of designs to increase the throughput? Yeah, so I mean, there's going to be two fundamental mechanisms we can use. Either it'll be through sharding. Um, so sharding ends up being pretty interesting with the Cosmos SDK because it's actually pretty easy to start. Like it would basically be a new zone that is making use of the hub that we've already created. Um, yeah. The downside with that approach is that having atomicity between the different shards is going to be pretty difficult. Like that's an unsolved area of research that like no chain has actually successfully caught that right yet. Um, so maybe maybe we could be the first ones to do that. But um, the, the other approach that we could use is making use of more of a roll up centric architecture. Um, and right now we're seeing that with Nitro as well. Um, it's like Nitro is able to build very easily on top of say. And using, say, for a settlement and data availability layer, I think ends up being pretty interesting. Um, because as soon as you have, let's say you have a gaming focus roll up, there ends up being some kind of activity that happens. There ends up being some tokens that are created. And then you need to do something with those tokens. So the natural place to be doing something with those tokens would be on a chain that is optimized for trading that has the best way for um, exchanges to scale. And realistically, at that point, we'd also have a lot of trading activity happening over there. So there, there would be network effects and um, composable applications built on top of the exchanges that are already there. Um, so yeah, I think the roll-up centric architecture ends up being pretty interesting in the longer term. And with roll-ups, you also have more flexibility around what kind of trust assumptions you want to make for each of the individual roll-ups. Like if there's a gaming focused roll-up, then they might not necessarily need to have too much decentralization happening. So they might be okay with just having a centralized sequencer. Um, so you can have, like, you can basically pick and choose how you want to be scaling your specific applications. Okay, very cool. And are you recruiting at say? Yes. Um, so we have a jobs page on our website. Um, there's a lot of different positions we're looking for. Um, one that I'll highlight is a blockchain researcher position. So right now from say's side, we're solving a lot of pretty hard, in some cases, novel blockchain related problems as well. Um, so we're looking for people that have basically been through this entire process before um, and can help us ideate around like how we can improve say in the future. All right. Another question I like to ask our guests on the, the Entrepreneur Podcast is the following. Aside from Say Network, which is your project, are there any other innovations, any other blockchains or DeFi protocols that you, you're you following lately that, that you find interesting? I know that, th that there are many, you cannot you know, quote all of them, but could you just give us like a few, uh, a few names? I mean, the one that I'm most excited about right now is 
uh, Nitro and all of the other SVN rollups that are being like launching and being planned to launch right now. Um, and I think it's really interesting. Like the reason that EVM, the reason that Ethereum, I think, ended up becoming one of the most successful chains out there is not just because it was the first market. I think it's also because it was able to get a lot of developer mind share through Solidity and through the EVM. And I see something similar happening with Solana right now. Like right now, the SVM is, um, there, there's multiple projects that are building SVM rollups. And in the future, I think SVM is going to become one of the standards for uh, the execution environments that people can be using. Um, and because of that, I think that's going to be cementing Solana is a chain that is not going to be going away anytime soon either. Um, and I think that a lot of other general purpose chains, like if they're basically just using EVM, um, I think it's going to be harder for them to maintain developer mindshare in the future once there's a lot of general purpose chains and the SVM based chains are, and rollups are going to be pretty interesting to, to be following. Interesting. Well, as usual, guys, you'll find all the relevant links to get in touch with Sui in the description below. Feel free to ask your questions in the comment section. And yeah, Jay, thank you very much for being among us. If you have any last message to share with the French community, please, uh, please do. Otherwise, I'll be more than happy to sync with you probably post mainnet. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, last thought from my side is thank you all for listening to this. Um, if you want to get involved with Say, as we mentioned before, um, we're pretty active on Discord. So feel free to go to our website. There's a link to the Discord over there and you can go ahead and join. And besides that, um, thank you for having me on uh, so much, Sam. No, my pleasure, Jay. Thank you very much. Also forgot another disclaimer. This is obviously not a financial advice, so you should conduct your own research and ask your questions to your SAY team in order to take the best decisions. Jay, thank you so much for being here and uh, we'll get in touch soon. Awesome. Thank you, sir.